get into the word of God. And before we do, we do want to pray. So Father, as we bow our hearts before you, we like to give you thanks once again for who you are and what you are to us. Uh, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who indwells each and every believer. And I believe your Holy Spirit is here right now because he's omnipresent, you're omnipresent. And I just pray that you help us to be sensitive to your spirit, help us to um, uh, obey the guidance of your spirit. And I pray over the teaching of your word, Father, that uh, you'll bless me according to your will with the gift of teaching to help me to rightly divide your word of truth. And I do pray for a timely word, something we need to hear in this season tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to go through verses 1 through 16. And as usual, we do have a title for tonight's message. And the title is The Danger of Envy. The Danger of Envy envy. Now previously, David had defeated Goliath. And Goliath, of course, was a giant of a man who fought on behalf of the Philistines, one of the main enemies of the nation of Israel during this time. And King Saul was impressed with David. And he had David brought to him, as we see at the end of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. However, soon and very soon, we're going to see that Saul's feelings about David are going to change. It's going to go from one of admiration to one of envy. He's going to envy David. And we're going to learn from Saul about what not to do and why not to copy Saul? And so that's the thing that I love about the Bible. I love that about the scriptures is that God um, oversaw and he breathed out this word that we have re recorded here. And we see some good examples. We see some good examples in the scriptures as far as people are concerned, but some bad examples as well we can learn from so we don't copy them. And unfortunately, King Saul falls in that latter category. But we're going to take a look at verse 1 in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And it says, now, when he had finished speaking to Saul and he being David at this time, it says that the soul of Jonathan was knit. It was bonded to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And it's not surprising to me that Jonathan, King Saul's son, it's not surprising that he was bound to David in a close friendship. And it doesn't surprise me because they were both, they were like-minded, they, they were both brave. They were both skilled warriors. And both of these young men, Jonathan and David, they trusted in the Lord. And so it's not surprising that, that the soul of Jonathan was close-knit or bonded to the soul of this young shepherd, David, who had been anointed king. But of course, Saul does not know that at this time. And just to piggyback off of Jonathan and David being like-minded, I want to share with you that it is a blessing, of course, to be around like-minded believers. And I know I'm sharing that with you tonight, and for some of you, that's a reminder because that's something that you could have told me that it is such a blessing to be around like-minded believers that is, believers who understand you when you talk about your love for the Lord. And so when you talk about how much you love Jesus, they're, they're right here with you. They understand you because you're like-minded. They love Jesus just as much as you do. And so they don't mind a conversation about Jesus and your love for him. And it, it's good to be around like-minded believers who have the same heartbreaks in this life as we look at many of the things that are going on today. Some of these things that break our hearts and, and it's cool to, 
be with a like-minded believer who shares those heartbreaks and we can talk about them and pray about those heartbreaks that we experience and we see in this life. And it's good to get with a like-minded believer. Again, for example, when it regards prayer, because we appreciate prayer. We appreciate the fact that we serve a God that allows us to come to his throne of grace. He invites us to do that. And so like-minded believers appreciate that and take advantage of prayer in a good way. The like-minded believers, of course, they're going to care about the things that we care about. And so we find ourselves having our souls closely knit to that like-minded believer. And it's such a blessing. And Moving on to verse 2, it says that Saul took him that day. He took David that day and he would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Because remember, previously he was going back and forth from Saul back to his father to help his father with the sheep. But Saul took him that day and wouldn't let him go home anymore. And then Jonathan in verse 3 and David, it says, made a covenant. They made a, an agreement or a solemn pact because, because Jonathan loved him. He loved David as his own soul. And it says that Jonathan in verse 4 took off the robe. And, and I believe this was a royal robe that he took off and he gave it to David. He also took off his armor or his military tunic and he gave that to David and even his sword and his bow and his belt. You see, according to one source, it was considered a special mark of respect to be given by a prince some of the garments he has for his own wearing. It was a special mark of respect that was being shown here. And this source also says that the gift of a belt is a token of the greatest confidence and affection and was highly prized. And that's very interesting because although Jonathan was in line to become the next king of Israel after his father Saul, this gesture that he showed to David in, in, in giving his garments to him and his royal robe and even his weapons and his belt to David, those, that gesture showed that Jonathan was willing to give up his spot to David. And so it's almost as if Jonathan recognized God's calling in his hand upon David's life to be the next king of the nation of Israel. And what this tells me is that Jonathan was not about to get in the way of David's calling. He was not about to get in the way of God's plan in and through David's life. And I would say for us, it's best that we don't get in the way of other people's callings. Because if we get in, in other people's way of whatever their calling may be from the Lord, then we're getting in God's way. And we don't want that to be said of us. In verse 5, it says, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and he behaved wisely. In other words, that just simply means that David was very successful. And so Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And so all the people, all the army, the, the entire army and, and all of Saul's servants, they were pleased that King Saul placed David over the men of war. They really liked David. And so just from that verse, we see that David was successful in all that he put his hands to. And the reason, and you know this already, that he was successful is because the Lord was with him. And this kind of reminds you of Joseph. Everything that Joseph put his hands to in, in the book of Genesis, you see that he was successful. And again, he too was successful because the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord was with David as well. Just successful in whatever once again, he put his hands to, and, and we too, we can experience success in what we put our hands to. That is, if we are walking in the Lord's will. Not if we're walking in our own will. 
Not if we're just, uh, just going with a hunch that comes from ourselves. Not, not because we're being influenced by friends or family members to do something. No, I'm talking about walking in the will of the Lord. Understanding what God's will is for your life and what his will is for you to do. And then you walk in that. And if we do that, we can experience this same success. And I say that because God wouldn't call us to something in order to watch us fail. He wouldn't call us to something in order to make us fail either. And in verse 6, it says, now it happened that as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, speaking of Goliath, that, that big giant of a man, it says that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel. They were singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy or shouts of joy, and also with musical instruments. And so the women sang as they danced. And the women, they said this in their song. They said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me, they have ascribed only thousands. And he says, now what more can he have but the kingdom? And so Saul eyed David from that day forward. Now, according to another source, it was customary for the women to express their delight in victory by songs and music and dancing in the presence of the conquerors. And we even see this in Exodus chapter 15 when Miriam, Moses' and Aaron's sister, when she was dancing. And so we, we, we see support for this statement that it was customary for them to, to express their delight in these songs and music after a victory. So we see support of that in the scriptures. And you can also look in Judges uh, chapter 11, verse 34. And I believe that's Jephthah's daughter, one of the judge's daughters. She came out dancing and such. And so, yes, it was customary. And this song was cool. I want you to notice this. This song was so cool. It was number one on the charts. When, when, When Saul heard the first line. Oh, when he heard the first line of the song that Saul has slain his thousands, Saul was like, turn that music up. I love that song. But then he quickly soured on the song once he heard the second line where it says, and David, his ten thousands, all of a sudden, DJ, remove that song from your list. He was upset. And so here in these verses, we, we, we see the start of Saul's obsession with killing David. You see, Saul wanted to get rid of whomever he sought as a threat to his throne. In this case, of course, we know that David was a threat. And remember, Saul didn't know that Samuel, that great prophet, had anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Oh, remember, King Saul didn't know that. God had devised a plan to where Saul wouldn't know about it and wouldn't get suspicious about it. But now you see him become suspicious of David. He is now a threat. And when I see this picture here of Saul threatened by David, because Saul doesn't want to give up his throne, the throne that he's currently on, on according to the lesson. It, oh, it reminds me of Satan. It, it reminds me of the fact that, uh, that we are a threat to Satan's throne and people's lives. Not that we're going to replace Satan on the throne of people's lives, but this is what I mean. What I mean by this is as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, what we're doing is introducing people to a new king who's going to replace 
Satan on a throne of people's lives. And so because we're doing that, we're preaching the gospel and, and we are a threat or really Jesus is a threat as we share the gospel with people. I would say this, don't be surprised when Satan and his army comes after you because he sees you as a threat. You're, you're trying to replace Satan on the throne of people's lives because you're preaching about this Jesus, this Jesus that we talk about. We call him the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We call him Savior. We, we said earlier that there is no other name by which man can be saved. We know that he is the Word of God. As it tells us in John chapter 1, the capital W, Word of God. We see all these things about Jesus. We introduce this new King Jesus to people who are under the sway of the devil. And the devil, he doesn't want to release people from his kingdom. And so he sees us as a threat as we preach the gospel about Jesus Christ, this new King and notice this, he's, he, speaking of Satan, he's not going to fight against you if you're helping him. And so some of us, we really need to think about that because some of us wonder, how come in the world, the, the only people who get put out there, whose, whose name gets defamed, are the Christians how come they can talk bad about Jesus, but if they talk bad about another God, then they're going to be canceled. If they talk bad about this theory or that theory, then they're going to be canceled. But, but they can speak anything they want to speak when it comes to Jesus, no matter how negative it is. They can blaspheme the name of Jesus and won't be canceled. They can talk bad about Christians and call us all out of our names and they won't get canceled. But all these different groups and organizations, they come together. We say something bad about them, oh, we'll be canceled. Social media will take us off, will take us out, will fact check you. Why is that? The reason is because Satan is not going to fight against himself. You know, the, the, the Bible believing Christian, and it's sad that I have to say that because some people are Christian in name only. So I have to tell people that I'm a Bible believing Christian. It's sad that we have to say that. The true believers. Oh, he's going to fight against us. Because we are going against him, Satan and his kingdom and and Jesus says something interesting here. He says something in Matthew 12, uh, verses 25 through 26. It says, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation or destruction. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And the reason Jesus said that is because the Pharisees said that Jesus was casting out demons by Beelzebub, which is a name for Satan, the ruler of demons. And so that's why Jesus said that statement in, in Matthew 12, 25. And, and Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 12, 26, that if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So why is it that you can say things about this group and this group and that group, even though they have different names, different theories, and, and, and you get canceled, but when they say something about Christians or Jesus, people don't get canceled. Why is that? Because Satan is not going to fight against himself. Because the scriptures say, and Jesus' words are recorded here, that every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And Satan has enough common sense to know that. And so it could be the name of this false religion, that cult, that false religion, this theory, or whatever it may be. This movement, whatever it may be, if it's not Bible, biblical Christianity, oh, they're not going to tear each other apart. Because if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. And Pastor Durrell, why are you spending so much time talking about this? And I'm spending time talking about this because 
God does not want us to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And so we, we can see as we spend more time in the word of God, as we spend more time in prayer, we, we can see Satan's tactics from a mile away. And so that's why we're spending so much time on this point. And so therefore, if Satan is coming against you, then you must be on the right side. That is God's side. And guess what? Just as Saul's eye was on David, oh, Satan's eye is on you. When you say yes to Jesus, when you allow, when you align yourself with Jesus, oh, Satan's eye is on you. You are a threat to his kingdom, just like David was a threat to Saul's throne. Oh, Satan's eye is on us for we have a new king who sits on the throne of our hearts and we're telling other people about this king. Say, hey, you need to get rid of that old old king of your flesh. You need to get rid of that old king called Satan or the devil. You need to get rid of that king because we we have a king who has the sweetest name that is ever known and his name is Jesus and the enemy doesn't like that we're sharing that. See, the gospel is powerful. It is powerful. It changes lives. In verses 10 and 11 in 1 Samuel 18, it says, And it happened on the next day that the distressing or this tormenting spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied. In other words, he he raved madly. So this wasn't prophesying from from God. We believe this. It it could mean that he's just babbling. You know, just out of his mind inside of the house. And so if you look at the context, that that view makes sense because David had to play music. He had to play music with his hand on his string instruments on the harp or the lyre, just like at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And it says that Saul cast a spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. So we see here that David is trying to play music to refresh Saul, just like he had done in the past. But it's crazy that Saul is trying to kill him. And then David was gracious and merciful enough to go back. And I know that he went back because it says that David escaped his presence twice. And so he's trying to calm this man down, trying to help this man. And he throws a spear at him, wanting to pin him to the wall. And and sometimes in life, I'll share this with you, the, the, the very people that you're trying to help, the, the very people that you are metaphorically or spiritually playing music to, trying to share the gospel of peace with them, trying to share something that's going to refresh their souls with them. You're sharing the word of God with them. You're pointing them to the scriptures. You're pointing them to Psalm 23 about the Lord being our shepherd and how we shall not want. We shall not lack anything. You're pointing them to these scriptures to be a blessing to them, playing this music for them in a metaphorical way. But these same people you're trying to help and trying to refresh spiritually, they have these spears pointed at you. You're like, wait a minute, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to speak the truth to you in love. And and you have a spear. You're you're trying to take me out. You're trying to defame me. You're you're, you're trying to, you're cursing me out. You're putting me out of your house. You're hanging up in my face. (laughs) Calling me out of my name on... Facebook or whatever they changed their name to. And I'm just trying to share the truth with you because I don't want to see you die and go to hell. You see, we play the music of the gospel to people, the music of the word of God to people. And I know you've experienced, but yet they would toss spears at us. And what's crazy is that a lot of this, a lot of times this comes from family. I'm talking about blood relatives and you know it. You don't have to say amen, but I know it. 
And we love them anyway, right? But, but a lot of times, because they've seen you grow up, they, they've seen the way you used to be, they don't want to hear it from you. They don't want to hear the music of the gospel, the music of the word of God that you're sharing with them. And so they're going to toss spears at you. I remember you when you used to be this way. Who do you think you are now? Think you're better than me? Think your kids are better than my kids? But praise God, we're not in this alone because we have each other. But also remember, Jesus experienced this. The, the, the very people he came to die for, the, the very people he came to speak the truth to, the very people that he loved so much. Oh, they turned on him. Oh, they betrayed him. They, they scattered from him. They spit in his face. They, they, they blindfolded him and hit him and told him and asked him, hey, who hit you? They blasphemed his name. They, they mocked him while he was on the cross. If you really are who you say you are, why don't you come down and save yourself? And praise God, he didn't come down to save himself because we would not have a chance to be saved. Well, that same Christ would stay on that cross. And he would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so, yes, that same Jesus came to be a blessing to people and those people in a metaphorical way. Oh, they cast spears at him with the blaspheming, with the spit, with the putting the crowns on his head and then taking the, the, the rod or whatever they gave him and then taking that same rod and banging him in the head with it, even while he had the crown of thorns. And so, yes, we have company when it comes to people casting spears at us, although we're trying to help them. In verse 12, it says, now Saul was afraid of David. And he was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And therefore Saul removed him from his presence and, and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and he came in before the people. So in other words, David, he, he publicly associated with the people. Or it could be said that he led the troops, the army. And David, once again, behaved wisely in all his ways. In other words, he had success in all of his undertakings. Whatever he did, he prospered. And the Lord was with him. And therefore, in verse 15, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, when Saul saw that David greatly prospered, Saul, this king of Israel at this time, was afraid of him. He dreaded David. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and he came in before them. He led their troops. He publicly associated with them. So the people love David. And just like how Saul was afraid of or intimidated by David, I, I, would, I would think that there are some people who oppose you who are maybe intimidated by you. And maybe they come against you so hard. Maybe they're so hateful towards you. Maybe they threaten you so much because they're really fearful of you. They're really intimidated by you. And they're intimidated by you, number one, because they can see the Lord's hand in your life. Just like Saul saw the Lord's hand was in David's life. He saw that the Lord was with him. So maybe it's that same way with us. And they, the people who oppose us, they can't explain it. But they know that there's something different about us. They just can't explain it or they try to debate you they try to throw out these hard questions toward you and and I don't mind the hard questions but just be sincere in your questions so one thing you should ask people who ask tough questions or these outrageous questions is if I give you the answer if I give you the answer to that would you consider giving your life to Jesus you see, some people, they just want to toy with you. They just want to mock you and just throw out something crazy, just trying to stump you. But they really don't want to hear an answer. So before you waste your time, ask them, if you get the answer to that, would you consider Jesus? 
See, they try to debate you. But you have an answer for everything. And so they begin to see that there's something different about this person. And so they're intimidated by you, just like Saul was afraid of David. Or, or maybe they're fearful or intimidated by you because you keep being successful. Even when they scheme or pull for you to fail, there, there are some people who are secretly in their hearts pulling for you to fail. Oh, this person, they're always talking about Jesus. They're, they're always carrying their Bibles. They're, they're always posting these scriptures on Instagram or whatever. But I can't, I, I can't wait to see them have some trouble. I, I like to see what their God is going to do. I, I like to see them be successful in that trial. But secretly in their hearts, they're pulling for you to fail. And so some are intimidated by you because you keep on being successful. You keep on rising above. And that's because the Lord is with you. Oh, they get mad. They get intimidated by you because they can't get over on you. They try to cheat you, but they can't. In fact, they have a hard time even looking at your walk. Your Christian walk, your lifestyle is what I'm talking about. And, and they can't even find an obvious sin in your life. And that disappoints some people. Well, you think you're super spiritual, huh? I used to go to church when I was 10. I went to church before you did. I had, some, I had a family member tell me that. I was sharing Christ with them. I used to go to church before you. <laughs> do, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Some people will say that. They, they see that you keep prospering. You're down and out. You got laid off from this job and that job. This family member got sick. That, that family member got sick. This family member died. But yet and still you have joy. Yet and still you continue to prosper. Yet and still God continues to make a way out of no way for you. When people who oppose you, they don't like that. They're intimidated by you. Just like Saul was afraid of David because David behaved very wisely. And that's another way, again, of saying that David had great success. So, yes, in this lesson, we do. We, we do see more flaws in King Saul. Because not only was Saul jealous of David... That is, jealous that his throne would be lost to David. But, but Saul was also envious of David. In other words, he wanted the attention that David was receiving. And so, by definition from Merriam-Webster, envy is the feeling of wanting to have what someone else has. It is the painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed or enjoyed by another joined with the desire to possess the same advantage. And so in other words, a person who is envious, they are upset that you are blessed. They are upset that you have an advantage. They are upset that you're getting all these compliments like, like David was getting the compliments about the 10,000s he's slain. But on top of that, Saul wanted, he wanted that same praise. He was envious. And now, depending on who you ask, according to Miriam Webster, jealousy and envy are either exact synonyms, totally different words, or they're near synonyms with some degree of meaning overlap and maybe some differences. Now, both jealousy and envy are often used to indicate that a person is covetous of something that someone else has. But here's the thing with jealousy. Jealousy carries the particular sense of zealous vigilance. And it tends to be applied more exclusively to feelings of protectiveness regarding one's own advantages or attachments. And so with jealousy, 
oftentimes something belongs to you anyway. And so you're jealous for what belongs to you. And so we saw that King Saul was, was jealous in that way. Because the throne in his mind was his. And so he thought he was going to lose it to David. What more can he have but the kingdom? And so, yes, he was jealous. But then he was also envious. In what way? In that he wanted what David had. He wanted the praise that David was getting. And one Bible scholar, Warren Wearsby, says it this way. And I'll just quote him because he said it beautifully. He, he says that envy is the pain we feel within when somebody achieves or receives what we think belongs to us. It says, envy is the sin of successful people who can't stand to see others reach the heights they have reached and eventually replace them. And so envy is dangerous. And Pastor Darrell, why is envy so dangerous? And one reason it's dangerous is because it causes us to overlook what God has already done for us and through us. And so Saul missed out on what God had done. Because the lady saying that he slain his thousands... And so it wasn't like he was a chump. It wasn't like he didn't do anything. No, he has slain thousands. And so that envy caused him to overlook what God had done in him and through him and for him. And so what happens is that we, we miss out on praising God for all the good that he has done. And we're looking around church. We're like, wow, these people are always lifting up their hands, praising the Lord. This person is always saying hallelujah. And, and this person is just so happy to be here. And I just have nothing to praise God about. Well, well could it be that you're envious of someone else? And, and so you're so focused on what somebody else has that you're missing out on praising God for all the good that he has done. And so, yes, it causes us to overlook what God has done for us and through us. But, but it's also dangerous because where, wherever there is envy, there is ungratefulness. And we become unthankful, which means we become a complainer, which means we become like King Saul. Oh, they said that David killed his 10,000s, but me, they only ascribe thousands to. We become a complainer instead of being grateful. That's not a good place to be. So envy is dangerous in that way, but it's also dangerous because where there is envy, there is also selfishness. Oh, that song was a number one hit, as I mentioned earlier. When they were talking about Saul, when they were complimenting Saul and how many people he killed, how many people he defeated. But he did not want David to get any attention. So where there's envy, there is selfishness. We have the attitude of, I want all the attention. I don't want anybody else to get any. No compliments for David, especially if he has more kills than me. Where there is envy, there is selfishness. But guess what? It's also dangerous because there is pride in envy. And so in his heart, he didn't think that David was better than him. He looked down on David. And so Saul, he saw himself in a higher position than he thought he was in. Yes, he was king. But he thought of himself higher than he, had, than he ought to. So yes, there is pride and envy. And we know that God is not a fan of pride. But the, the, the other danger about envy, and this is point number five, is that there is no love in envy. If you're envious of something, you want to you wanna take somebody else's place. Whatever they get, whatever they've been blessed with, you want that. You're angry about it. You're resentful about that. That's, that's no love. There's no love in that. 
And I can prove it with 1 Corinthians 13, 4, because it says that love suffers long and is kind. And it says that love does not envy. But the other danger about envy is that it adds another step to the staircase of doing evil or evil doing. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at James 3, verse 16. The scriptures say that it says, for where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. So where there is envy, where there is selfish ambition or, or, or self-seeking, where those things exist, then there's going to be confusion and there's going to be every evil thing present. And so that's why I say that envy, it, you know, it adds another step to the staircase of doing evil or evil doing. And we have an example here in the text because that envy, it caused Saul to throw a spear at David. That's evil doing. And also envy caused the chief priest to turn Jesus over to Pilate. And Pilate even knew it. He knew they were envious of Jesus. Speaking of these chief priests, these religious leaders. And so envy, as that other step to the staircase of doing evil, but it's also dangerous because having envy in our hearts, it suggests that God did something wrong. Having envy in our hearts suggests that God did something wrong. And so, in other words, we're saying, God, you promoted the wrong person. It should have been me. God, you blessed the wrong person. It should have been me. God, I've been praying to have children and that other person is having children. That should have been me. And so you're telling God when there's envy in your heart that, look, God, you've done something wrong. You don't know what you're doing. And so in that way, envy is dangerous. But also, and this is huge, envy will keep us from reaching our full potential in Christ. Right, that's the goal. We want to be all that we could be in Christ Jesus on this side of eternity. And we want to do everything God wants us to do in Christ Jesus also on this side of eternity. But envy will keep us from reaching whatever our full potential is in Christ Jesus. And why is that, Pastor Durrell? And it's because we're too focused if we're envious of someone, we're, that means we're too focused on what someone else has instead of what God has for us and what he wants us to do. And, and so as long as we're not focused on what we should be focused on, then we'll never reach our full potential in Christ. We're going to always fall short of that full potential in him. So yes, maybe, maybe tonight, there's somebody watching or maybe there's somebody in the room who's been, who's been struggling with envy. Or maybe that's happening now. Or, or maybe you know someone who is struggling with envy. And maybe you're, you're envying someone who is of the world. Maybe you're envying the unbeliever. The person who has not put their faith in Christ. They're living any kind of way they want to live, but yet and still, they have the highest paying jobs. They have the best cars. They have the biggest houses. They, they have all the children that they want and so forth. So maybe you're envying or know someone who is envying someone who is not a believer. And so maybe you're in that category where you're like, okay, this doesn't apply to me. Well, I'm just going to say, well, put this lesson in your back pocket because you may come across somebody who's struggling with this. But if you or someone you know is envying someone who's of the world, someone who's living a sinful life, envious of them because everything seems to be going well for them. I'd like to point your attention to Psalm 73 verses 1 through 3. And this is awesome. It says that truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, the psalmist says, he says, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. He says, for I was envious of the boastful. 
when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. No, it does seem that way. That I've been serving the Lord all these years. I've been reading my Bible all these years. I've been coming to church Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, even on Saturday, going to men's fellowship and so forth. Every other Tuesday night, I go to the women's study. Some of you may be saying, but yet there's some people who are just living like they want to live, blaspheme Jesus, and they seem to get everything that they want. And so some of us could understand where this psalmist is coming from. I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. However, and I love this, the psalmist recognized something later on. Because if you keep reading Psalm 73 and you get to verse 17, it says he saw all this stuff about them. They're prospering, they're rich and all this stuff. And he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Then I understood the end of the wicked, where they're going to end up. And so one thing we need to remember if you're struggling with this, envying the, the, those who are in the world, those who are of the world, I should say, those who don't have a relationship with Jesus, they seem to be doing well. If you're envying that. Remember our end versus the end of the one who rejects Christ. For the one who lives a life in which they're rejecting Christ, this is as good as it's going to get right here, right now. Their best life is going to be lived right now, not in eternity. We still have eternity for us who put our faith in Christ, Bible-believing Christians, true believers. We still have eternity with the Lord to look forward to. So the best is yet to come for us. And, And the psalmist, he began to understand that when he went into the sanctuary of the Lord. And that just reminds us of something that is so profound. And it reminds me of the fact that sometimes we may be having a bad day. Sometimes we may be envious of of the wicked. It seems like they're doing so well, doing way better than believers. But then you come to church on a Sunday morning and and you begin to hear those worship songs and you begin to hear the spiritual truth in these songs. You begin to see how blessed you really are. You you begin to remember where you're going to spend eternity. And then you hear the lesson from the pastor and the message reminds you that Jesus is coming back for his church one day. The lesson reminds you that you're going to get a glorified body one day and that you're not going to have a sin nature anymore. You're not going to die anymore. You won't be in pain anymore. There won't be any sickness anymore in eternity that you're going to experience a new heavens and a new earth. You come to the sanctuary. You come to church and you are reminded of that. And then you come to an understanding of, wait, why am I envious of someone who's going to end up in hell when the Lord promised me all these things? And it's not that we're gloating about that. Because our job is to be ambassadors, to share the gospel with those same people that that some of us may have envied at one point. So I'm not gloating about that. But the point is, why should we envy them? Why should we envy the world when we have all this privilege in Christ? As the worship team comes up, but, but, but maybe there's some people here or watching or listening, or maybe there's somebody you know who are who are even envying some people who are saved, who are in the church. And if that's the case, I just want to remind you of the fact that we're serving the same God and we're on the same team. But overall, I want you to remember this, that whatever God has for you, is for you. Whatever God has for you is for you, and God does not make any mistakes. So there's no need for us to be envious of anyone else. We stay focused on the Lord. We do our part. And whatever we have coming from us or to us, it's all by God's grace, but it is for us. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We pray, Lord, that you help us to overcome any emotion that is not of you, whether it's envy, jealousy, whether it's uncontrolled anger, whatever it may be. 
Lord, any emotion that is not of you, help us to get over that. Help us to be more of that light and salt you called us to be. Help us to be more like Jesus. And equip us for your work this week. Strengthen us this week in every part of our being, Father. Fill us afresh with your spirit. Fill us afresh with joy and gratitude in our hearts. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And bless my brothers and sisters on their way home. Bless them with traveling grace. Bless their week. In Jesus' name, amen.